Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think the real show tonight isn't in Brussels, but it's here in Westminster. I have the great pleasure of being one of the founding three of uh, Grassroots Out. Uh, the other conspirators were Kate Hoey MP from Vauxhall and Tom Perscoff from Corby. Before we start, you might see a roving camera. Um, we're making Brexit the movie. And I'm going to ask the producer just to come up, up here and say a few words. Um, can I welcome Martin Durkin? Thanks very much. My God, look at you all. What a lot of you there are. Is. Um, uh, thank you very much for um, uh, inviting me up to talk about the bit. This is going to be gone with the wind of Brexit. Um, we thought of going to the BBC and the EU for funding, but we didn't know where we were going to get. So we went on a Kickstarter instead. Um, and so far we have got a thousand backers, more than a thousand. Um, but my producer said, tell them we need some more money. So we need some more money. And, they, and the producer said, but look at the crowd. If all of them gave 20 pounds each, we'd have more than enough to produce and distribute it. And I did say, unfortunately, a large part of them may have given 20 pounds already. Um, another large part may not trust us with 20 pounds in a month of Sundays. And another section will think they're going to give us 20 pounds, but then go out for a beer and a curry and forget all about it. So. <laughs> If you're one of the ten people who aren't in those three categories, could you please give us £2,000 each? Um, but the really moving thing about the Kickstarter is that people are giving all little amounts of money, some, sometimes quite a lot of money, but for some people it's, they're giving £55 and £7 and stuff that they can afford. And it really has come home to us that this is an issue which it matters enormously to people. They think that our right to determine our own laws and to shape our own future is more important than the false promise of cheap mobile phone chargers and whatever other nonsense they're throwing at us. Thank you ever so much for turning up. Thank you if you are able to support the movie and here's to an independent Britain. Thank you so very much, uh, Martin. Now, the first speaker uh, we have tonight has just come back um, from Brussels. He's been fighting for the British interest. He likes to be called Dave. Um, <laughs> I'm it's my proud privilege to introduce the uh, Chairman of Conservatives of Britain and the Chairman of the Go Movement's Political Advisory Committee, David Campbell Bannerman, MEP. This is for our natural ability to act independently, so we have no alternative to, but to pool and share our armed forces. These European events moves are profoundly dangerous and must be stopped in their tracks. The truth then is that the Council has handed yet more powers over to the e EU Powers over the UK economy, when will the people be told the truth? We are heading for an EU super state and Britain will have to pay to rescue those in the Euro even though we are not a member of the Euro ourselves. <laughs> Well, Peter, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and it's an amazing turnout tonight, thousands here tonight. Uh, thank you, Peter, Tom, and Kate, for your common sense and hard work in setting up GO. It's been a great success so far. You know, it's only been a few weeks, and here we go. Um, now, I'm David Campbell Bannerman, MEP, uh, and uh, I believe in taking back control of our country. How about you? Yeah. 
We have a really brilliant lineup of speakers tonight. And what really matters is this is cross-party. Uh, we have Labour represented, the excellent Kate Hoey. We've got Conservatives, fellow Conservatives. We've got UKIP. We've got some excellent experts from the trade union movement uh, and from uh, economists and all of that area. So we have an amazing cross-section tonight. Um, and we have a surprise guest that is so surprising, I don't even know who it is. <laughs> And by the way, if the lights go out, just follow this tie. <laughs> now, we've had a pantomime in Brussels, but now we have the real show here in London. <laughs> this referendum is a huge event in our national history. It is a momentous opportunity, the biggest political challenge of our lifetimes. Britain can recover confidence in itself, leave the shackles of the European Union and become a self-governing, independent nation once again, free to shape a bright and exciting future outside of the EU. And we will be big globalists, not little Europeans. <laughs> so tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we are declaring the Declaration of Independence for our country. Now, the inside, Remain, have nothing positive to say about staying in the EU. But the British people aren't stupid, and they won't buy these scare stories. You know, in the Norwegian referendum, 1994, which no one, by 52% to 48%, uh, you had all the same scaremongering. They said if Norway wasn't in the EU, it would lose jobs. Well, unemployment went down. They said investment would fall. Well, it went up. They said exports would fall. Well, they went up too. The stock market would fall. Well, it surged immediately after the vote. <laughs> they said Norway, little Norway, would be all alone. Uh, uh, it would be isolated. It wouldn't have a seat at the table. You've heard that one, haven't you? Uh, but now Norway is on most global uh, bodies around the world. It has the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world one of the richest and happiest countries on the globe. No wonder a recent poll found 72% of Norwegians are happy with their deal. Now today we are united in one cause and nothing should come between us and that great cause. Not ego, not ambition, not career, not party advantage, nothing because all of us here today put country before party. Well, as the chairman said, I was in Brussels this morning and then rushed back here for various media interviews. And there we had the dodgy, first of all, we had the dodgy dossier. Remember that on the Iraq war? Now we've got the dodgy deal. And neither is clearly legal. And you and I know that whatever the drama we've seen over the last few weeks, this non-deal is feeble, worthless, and irrelevant. There is nothing in this deal on cutting our contributions to the EU by billions. Nothing taking back powers over fishing, farming, trade deals, customs union, energy, environment, transport, tourism, social policy, consumer protection, justice, home affairs, health, culture, tourism, education or training. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> nothing in the deal. They're all powers we've lost in whole or part to the EU and they're not covered by this deal. The negotiations have been an illusion, a magician's trick. Nothing of substance will change. Nothing is guaranteed. None of it is legally enforceable or deliverable. This piece of paper, this non-deal, is an IOU. It's like a blank check, unsigned, undated, unclear, and forever stuck in the post. <laughs> now, I'm an MEP as you know, and I can tell you the European Parliament, that Federalist sausage machine, the European Parliament, 
would just love to overturn this deal after we voted to remain, if that's the case. They resent any special treatment. They see us all as one country already, all of us as EU citizens. That's not we be what we believe, is it? No. So forget this deal. It's irrelevant. The choice in this referendum is between superstate or sovereignty. And the political road to that superstate is paved with opt-outs, excuses and political cowardice. There is no reformed European Union on offer. And there will be no status quo either. Voting for Remain is a real danger to this country because we'll be signing this country up for 30 years at least. By then, we'll be a sad, overtaxed slave region in a country called Europe. Now we hear of the risk of leaving all the time, but what of the risk of remaining? We face a common, thank you. <laughs> we face a common welfare and repension system. You have French and German pensions which have trillions missing and that have to be paid for. If you have to share a pension system, you have to pay for it. What about harmonised higher taxes? They're already doing it in the Eurozone now. What about VAT on food and children's clothes? What about greater economic decline? The Eurozone hasn't been a great success, has it? What about higher energy bills to pay for all those crazy policies? An EU single army to die for, they're really keen on that. Uh, being laid open to millions more migrants from Albania, Bosnia and Turkey joining the EU. A common health system that threatens our NHS and losing our special role on the UN with our embassies and our influence withering away. The real choice then is whether we want to remain and sign up to a European country, this European superstate, or to leave and be an independent and governing nation again, self-governing nation again, reclaiming our national sovereignty. Now people challenge us, well what is your alternative plan then? outside the EU. Well, in one sentence, it's quite simple. Britain will negotiate a great trade deal with the European Union because we are its largest single customer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I call this WTO plus. I don't want to get technical, but WTO is guaranteed because that's under World Trade Organization rules. That's the fallback position. But we can do better than that. We can negotiate WTO plus. And Canada is about to get a WTO plus deal with 99% of tariffs removed for non-agricultural goods. So we can do it too. And then we can run our country like Canada and Australia and the USA run their countries, restoring democratic control, economic control, and border control. That's one sentence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, the choice really is superstate or sovereignty. And we choose sovereignty. Yeah. All of us here believe we'll be freer, happier and wealthier outside the European Union. Now let's declare our independence. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to introduce the next speaker now, um, who's an old friend of mine, um, and uh, he's a former trade unionist, uh, and uh, he used to be in the Anti-Federalist League, if you can remember that, uh, and he's a telecommunications expert, Gerard Batten. Now, he is one of the founder members of UKIP. He was a party uh, secretary, his first party secretary, and he represents London, and has done so since 2004. He's written a host of policy papers, security and defence, civil liberties, uh, justice and home affairs. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gerard Batten. It's been an unparalleled and beneficial disaster for this country. In 
impartial English courts are now overridden by the political courts of the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. We've now reached to this uh, a situation where most of our laws are now made in Brussels and not by our own democratically elected parliament. A British citizen can now be sent off to any corner of the European Union on the strength of a piece of paper with vague accusations. They can be imprisoned for months or years. Well, we've stopped being a democratic country in my view, but then we're going to go further down the road of, being, of people being powerless and unable to actually influence the, uh, politics. I think people now feel that politics is something that's done to them, not something that's done for them. Well, thank you, David, for that very generous introduction. And look at the size of it. It's all go, isn't it? <laughs> what a crowd. It's absolutely fantastic. And I've got some good news for you. The tie works. <laughs> On the way here tonight, I popped into the corner shop and a lady said to me, what a beautiful tie. And I said, no, it's not. It's hideous. <laughs> but I'm wearing it for a reason. And she said, what's that? And I explained to her what I was doing, um, where I was going and what it was all about. And uh, she now knows, and that was the uh, first, uh, first of just two people who commented on the tie here. So I promised to say hello to Alison in Forest Gate because she said she's going to watch the news bulletin. <laughs> so I think you've chosen the colours well. Now, um, I've actually been quite ill today because I, I, I've got flu or something. And if, if I wasn't on the platform tonight, I'd be tucked up in bed. And I've been drifting in and out of consciousness all day and uh, wrapped myself up and was watching the daytime television. Uh, and you know that there's some, some old programs that they show and some pretty awful programs. And, you know, you can see things like The Incredible Hulk and The Six Million Dollar Man and The Saint. And I think, uh, you know, as I said, I, w I wasn't entirely with it today, but I think I was watching a pilot episode of a new drama program uh, along the lines of the things I've just described. Uh, and it seems to revolve around this, there's a plot in Europe, you know, having failed to um, unite Europe under Napoleon, the Kaiser, uh, and Hitler, they've decided to have another go. <laughs> and it's reached quite alarming proportions because they've been a bit cleverer this time and they've actually bought it. Uh, <laughs> and of course they've got quite, quite a long way. They, they, they now have their own government in Brussels. They, uh, they, they've taken over the banks. They've got their own currency. Um, they now control the borders, or rather don't control the borders. So there's no need to invade anywhere, anywhere else. You just get a ticket on the, on the train or Eurostar. Uh, and of course, the British government uh, has become a bit alarmed about this, so they spent, sent over Special Agent Dave. <laughs> now, this is the, uh, where the start of a very good concept for a pilot episode has started to go a bit wrong. Because unlike Roger Moore in his heyday or, or James Bond, Dave hasn't gone in there and sorted them out. He hasn't, you know, uh, attacked their HQ. He hasn't uh, beaten anybody up. He hasn't, uh, he hasn't done anything dynamic at all. Uh, what actually Dave has done is had a series of meetings with the protagonists over there, uh, and he's begged them that Britain won't have to become part of the Euro. Um, he's actually asked them, would they please repeal some of the awful unnecessary laws that they've made, the tens of thousands of laws, uh, if he asked them nicely. But there's no commitment on that they actually will. They're just humouring him, obviously. And, of course, he said, Would it, wouldn't it be a good idea if we didn't actually have to pay benefits to people who've never paid any tax into our system and are actually sending the benefits to people who don't live in our country? And they said they'd have a think about it. Um, <laughs> And then he really put his foot down because he said... <laughs> now, don't laugh. He said, we're going to have a red card, which means you cannot do things that we don't like. But, of course, that won't just be us saying that. That will have to be 15 other European countries who may or may not agree with us, uh, and uh, so it may not actually work anyway. So... 
This is where I say the concept starts to break down, because Dave has to come back now to, the, uh, to, the, to, to Britain, and he actually has to try and sell this to the British people. Now, is anybody convinced? <laughs> no. And I think that not very few people are going to be convinced. Uh, as, as, as David Campbell Bannerman pointed out earlier on, this really is about, do you want to be a region of a United States of Europe, or do you want to be... Uh, a, a self-governing, independent, democratic nation. Now, we all know what the answer is, and that is going to be the fundamental question that has to be put to the British people. It won't be about faffing around the edges on things that don't matter, uh, or if they do matter, they're not that important. The central issue, is, issue about is whether we're going to be a democratic nation or not. And this has been done before, of course. We have, uh, we have been through this before. Um, and if I can just say, I've actually got a bit of a sneak communique from 10 Downing Street um, about what they're going to put out tomorrow. I, you know, I, I'm in the know on this. And now let me give you a couple of quotes. Uh, we conf this is what the Prime Minister uh, said, or is going to say. We confidently believe that these better terms can give Britain a new deal in Europe, a deal that will help us and our partners in Europe. That is why I'm asking you to vote in favour of remaining. And he said, I believe that our renegotiation, obje uh, renegotiation objectives have been substantially, though not completely, achieved. Now, if those words sound familiar to you, uh, it's not because very similar words will be said tomorrow or a little uh, while in the future. It's because that's what Harold Wilson said in 1975. <laughs> Things were quite different in 1975. Uh, yes, we joined this thing. It didn't control most of our laws. Uh, we still had a veto. We lost the veto a long time ago. It now controls most areas of domestic policy. It now makes most of our laws. And nobody has an excuse now not for understanding what this project is about. It's about the creation of a European federal state, a United States of Europe. If you think that's a good idea, and I suspect nobody here does, but if there are members of the public who think that's a good idea, then vote to stay in. But if you don't think that, then you have no choice but to vote to leave. Now, I'll wrap up now because Harold Wilson did say a couple of things in that pamphlet that went out to every household uh, uh, that I agree with. And I'm going to give you a, a short quote. He said, The British Parliament in Westminster retains the final right to repeal the Act that took us, took us into the market on the 1st of January 1975. Thus, our continued membership will depend on the continuing assent of Parliament. Now, Parliament exists only to represent the people who elect it. When the people vote to leave the European Union, it will be the duty of Parliament to implement that, implement that decision and to take us out by the quickest and simplest means possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have another a duty to perform myself, which is this platform is not going to all be all about politicos and elected people and commentators. We've also got some people from the real world, the ordinary world, uh, who do ordinary jobs. We've got three people who I'm going to introduce to come up. Uh, one is Scott Kimber, who is a black cab driver, so very likely he's got a few opinions on things. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, another gentleman called Henrik Overgaard, who is Danish just to show that there are other people who agree with this. And I've been told that his father is uh, the kind of Danish equivalent of Richard Dimbleby. And, and the last person that I'm going to introduce is Pam Watts, who I believe is a finance consultant. So would they please come up and join us? Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen. 
My job this evening is to tell you what it's like to be a small business and strangled by the EU. I'm not a finance consultant at all, actually. <laughs> it's much more ordinary than that. I am actually an owner and director of a recycling plant in Kent. <laughs> Down where it's done and dirty. Anyhow, in December, we wrote off a £2 million investment. Now, £2 million probably is small beer to Google, unless it's tax. But it's a really big deal to us. This was an investment in British engineering, British innovation and British entrepreneurs. We made this investment to recover valuable commodities from a waste stream under the guidance of a European directive which regulates our sector. We checked with our agencies here that there was no alternative beyond landfill and, and we agreed that this would be best available treatment. Everybody applauded us. David Cameron swung by, Theresa May, Michael Fallon came to open the plant. But hardly had we started than a company in the Netherlands interpreted the same regulations differently and to a lower standard and decided to simply chuck the waste into concrete blocks. Needless to say, our competitors spotted an opportunity to get rid of this waste stream more cheaply. And under free trade and under the same European directive, there wasn't a damn thing our agencies here could do about it. Are you seeing how the EU is wrecking my business? Are you seeing that I'm angry? But it's not just mine. There are many stories of waste streams going to other member states to be processed to a lower and cheaper standard. For us, the EU is a race to the bottom. It stifles... <laughs> it has completely stifled innovation, and for us, there is no appetite for investment. But people are saying, what if we leave the EU? We need to know what's going to happen if we leave. Is the sky going to fall in? No, no, no. <laughs> and this is important. This is why the sky is not going to fall in. It's because businesses, sorry, trade is made by businesses not by politicians and not by bureaucrats. <laughs> Let me explain. Bureaucrats and politicians may hinder or help us, but ultimately trade is about this. It's about supply and demand. It's about competition and it's about cash flow. Let me tell you what will happen to our company the day after we leave. We will simply do what we do every day. We will ring up our customers in China, in India, in Australia and Europe and we'll see if they want to buy our commodities today. They will make a decision based on our price and our service, not on what bureaucrats say. be competitive? Well, the biggest problem with exporting is currency fluctuations. It always has been and nothing will change. Tariffs are irrelevant compared to flu uh, currency fluctuations. Will the EU make us jump through hoops to comply with their standards? The other side keep telling us, oh, we have to keep to EU standards. We're already in the EU. We already have to apply to EU standards. And we do it to the letter unlike the other member states. Yeah. In or out, we will have to meet the standards. More importantly, once out, they will have to meet our standards. Yeah. And that's where we can raise the bar at last. Tariffs? Do you think that tariffs are really going to be a problem? Look at what's happened to the steel industry, which has been a second hit to my business. They have sat back and let a flood of cheap, subsidised Chinese steel, 
wreck our steel industry, and through utter incompetence, they have not lifted a finger. This is, where, this is what's brought me here. Britain is a country of world-class engineers, scientists and researchers, supported by world-leading universities. That is what made us great. They are the people who will advance society and find cures and ways of making things better. Not bankers, not bureaucrats who have very limited social purpose in my eyes. Sadly, the EU is about bankers and bureaucrats and corporates. Just like I say, race to the bottom. I want our engineers and our scientists to have a fair playing field with regulation they can rely on. I want to invest with confidence. I want our engineers to lead the world, advancing our technology and science, as they always have done. I want them to look up and out into the global world. But to do that, we have to get rid of the EU shackles. Let's lead the world and not race to the bottom. One more little bit to that. Drowning in a sea of bureaucracy. Let's give our great, fabulous, talented people the chance to fly and lead. Thank you. Right, uh, you'll have to excuse me, I'm more used to talking over my shoulder. Um, <laughs> now, now, being a uh, London taxi driver for almost 18 years, I have seen many changes within my trade. Uber, without a doubt, is now the biggest threat to the London taxi trade. With heavy corporate backing and friends in high places, it is riding roughshod over authority, pushing the boundaries and challenging rules and regulations all the time, constantly defeating our licensing authority, Transport for London, in the courts. This, to me, is a glimpse of what TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, looks like, something the EU wishes to impose on all of us. Hundreds of licenses are being issued to private hire drivers every week by TfL, many of whom sign on to Uber, many of whom are foreign nationals that are willing to work for a pittance, thus driving down the cost, making it impossible for people like myself to compete. It's not only a question of my depreciating income, but also one of public safety. As a London cab driver, every three years I undergo a criminal records check to ensure I'm of sound character. Private hire drivers do too, but for those coming from other European countries, it is extremely difficult to obtain this information to the same level as my check. Assaults on passengers in Uber, uh, sorry, assaults on passengers in Uber vehicles are on the increase, along with the rate of accidents with their cars. Many of these drivers have had very little experience driving in Britain, let alone London, some even driving on foreign licences. But the problem isn't just Uber and the influx of foreign drivers. Our costs have risen considerably over the last decade or so, particularly the cost of our cabs thanks to the emission limits that stem from the EU. Soon we will be paying in excess of £50,000 for a cab with the proposed introduction of electric taxis, all in the name of cleaner air. So that's me as a worker. On a personal level, I am married with three young children, the oldest of which is 11. By the time he enters the workplace, he will be competing for a job with an additional two million people, at best, 
on current net immigration figures. And at voting age, with heavier influence from Brussels than we now have, should we vote to remain in the EU, his voice will count for less. His vote will become worthless. You see, for almost 30 years now, I've had the opportunity to vote for a government I felt would best serve my and my country's needs or voted against somebody to get them out of office. I want all my children to carry on receiving that right, feeling that their vote... <laughs> ..feeling that their vote can help shape their own destinies. Democracy, not bureaucracy. And now, thinking back to when I was a child of similar age, to my eldest, in the early 80s, believe it or not, my mum worked for an American company with a German boss who commuted weekly from Frankfurt, traded throughout Europe and it's from its European base in West London. She even drove a German car, a Volkswagen, although they didn't have to worry about the emissions then. <laughs> Every year or two we holidayed in Europe, changed our money up, showed our passports and so on. So what's changed? Why are we paying £55 million per day to do the same things we were doing 35 years ago for nothing? <laughs> On that note, I'm going to finish up with a question I asked many Europhiles who get in the back of my cab and wish they hadn't. <laughs> All of them are fair to give me an answer. <laughs> Is there anything we can only do from inside of the EU that we cannot do from outside of it? The truth is there is nothing we cannot do on our own. We are a proud nation with a proud history. Please, let's not give it away. My name is Henrik Overgaard Nielsen. I'm Danish. I'm an immigrant. <laughs> and I have to say, coming from a small country, it is almost frightening to see so many people gathered in one place. <laughs> and if I was David Cameron, I would be frightened. <laughs> In December last year, the Danish people, in a referendum, rejected to join the judicial pillar of the European Union. You might not have noticed that because BBC thought it not worth mentioning. <laughs> the Scandinavian peoples would really like the British people to vote for Brexit. because that would allow them to renegotiate a free trade agreement, continuing their close cooperation with their European cousins. It would also allow them for their parliaments to make decisions on their behalf. May I, as someone who has lived in this country for 20 years, urge you to vote for Brexit and the restoration of accountability and democracy. Thank you. Wasn't that terrific, ladies and gentlemen? Um, <laughs> when we uh, launched our first conference in Kettering, we had Sammy Wilson of the DUP warm us up. But actually, I think not listening to politicians and, looking, and listening to ordinary people has a great advantage. <laughs> so that leads me nicely to our next speaker. She's certainly not ordinary, but she works with her hands. She's a physiotherapist, which I knew I wouldn't be able to say. 
She's also a local councillor, but she is a director of GO. And Helen is our national uh, task force coordinator. We have 10 task forces across the country knocking on doors tomorrow morning, finding out what people actually think about the EU. And Helen will be leading uh, a task force in Corby tomorrow. And if anyone wants to turn up, it's 9.30 at the uh, Viking Club. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our national coordinator, Councillor Helen Harrison. Wow. <laughs> Look at you all. I've never spoken in front of a group this big before. Thanks so much for coming. As Peter, thank you, Peter, for that kind introduction. As Peter said, uh, like you, I'm just an ordinary voter. You and me, we are the grassroots. We're what this campaign is all about. And it's people like us and many thousands more up and down the country who are going to win this referendum and take Britain out of the EU. Now I'm here to tell you about Grassroots Out and I'm incredibly proud to be a director of Grassroots Out. We are a cross-party, cross-campaign group organisation. So if you want Britain to leave the EU, you're welcome in Grassroots Out and it is that simple. We're setting up uh, task forces across the country. Uh, I think this week alone we had 10 new start-up uh, and they are spreading across the country like wildfire. And what these task force groups are about is about people like you and me. Volunteers turning up, getting together, having a chat about the campaign, talking about what's going on nationally, talking about what we're doing locally, and then getting out in groups into our communities to knock on doors and talk to people. We're going to take the EU referendum campaign to the grassroots. And as Peter said, tomorrow morning I'm leading um, a task force in Corby in Northamptonshire. It starts at 9.30 in the morning at the Viking Centre. I don't know if any of you will be able to make it, but if you can, please do. We're planning to knock on thousands of doors in Corby tomorrow and find our voters. Find those people who also want to leave the EU. The reason behind that is so that we can then call them up on polling day, on referendum day, and get them to the polling stations and make sure they vote. Now, if there are some of you in the audience who think, well, you know, I don't really like knocking on doors, fear not. We have uh, just printed out uh, another two million leaflets that we need your help in delivering. So if that's more your thing, please help us with that. And the way to let us know that you can help is by filling in one of these cards. Every single one of you has one of these on your seats. Sorry to those of you uh, crammed around the sides. I'm sure we can find uh, cards for you to fill in. We need your contact details so that we can get you um, tied up with your local group. We need to know what it is you want to do for us. Do you want to campaign? Do you want to canvas leaflet? Uh, do you want to donate some money? Uh, or do you just want to give us your vote? All of which are fantastic. And speaking of donating, um, I'm sure you can imagine that uh, printing millions and millions of leaflets and running campaigns like this costs quite a bit of money. So we have got um, buckets for people to donate money in tonight. If any of you have got a little bit of spare cash and you want to help us out, please do. So that in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, is Grassroots Out. And I just want to finish to my little bit with a plea. Please, please, please. Don't just make this the one thing you do in this referendum campaign. We need every single one of you to do your bit. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. If we mess this up, we will never forgive ourselves. So please, together, with Grassroots Out, let's get out there and let's restore democracy to this great nation of ours. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, now, our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is a hero and mentor 
to all Eurosceptics. Um, he nobly led the Maastricht Rebellion a few years ago. He has been Shadow Attorney General, founded the European Foundation, uh, and is Chairman of the European Scrutiny Committee, and he grilled the Foreign Secretary only a week ago. Uh, what he doesn't know about Europe and constitutional affairs isn't worth knowing. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Bill Cash. This but it's since then that we have seen the accumulation, the dreadful promises, the betrayals, the, the prevarication. And I feel that the British people do feel that they have been betrayed. The fact is that 35 million people, I think it is estimated, 35 million voters have effectively been disenfranchised by this continuous evolution of giving away more and more, not merely powers, but the right to determine the kind of policies, the kind of government that they want. Well, what a relief to be amongst real people. <laughs> Why am I here? It's been a very long journey. 25 years since that Maastricht Rebellion. And why were we doing it then? For the same reason that you've just seen me speaking about in the House of Commons and as I've tried to do all these years. And I pay tribute to Peter and to David and to all the others and all of you for everything that you've done to try to restore to this country the right to govern itself. Now, you can all relax. I'm not going to talk about constitutional matters. That was just on the, uh, on the bit of paper here. I'm going to talk about what I feel. What I feel about this country. What happened over the last 40-odd years since we joined the European Union. The fact that since then, as we have gone further and further forward and deeper and deeper into this morass, of legislation, this increasingly offensive system which we now have to leave. Who in this room wants to leave the European Union? Do you want to leave? And I'll tell you why. Because it's about you. It's about your children. Just think about them. Think about your grandchildren. And think about your grandfathers and your grandmothers. And think about the fact that there were people who fought and died. Are we, going, are we going to allow ourselves to be put by virtue of these hopeless negotiations into a permanent second tier of a two-tier Europe dominated by other countries. No! no. I said in the House of Commons on the 3rd of February, why has my right honourable friend bypassed the promises and the principles that he set out? Why in the Bloomberg speech did he say that our Westminster democracy was the root of our future in our national parliament. Under the system which is now before us, and if we were to stay in, it will become worse and not better. This red card system you've heard about is a load of tosh. <laughs> it's an attempt to get people to believe that something is happening. That's where the betrayal takes place. That's why I am so deeply determined during the whole of this campaign to fight and to fight again for your rights, your children's rights, and to stand up for the principles for which those people sacrificed so much in the past. This, this, ladies and gentlemen, is about trust. 
It is about the trust that we have to place in our own selves. We have to fight for our future. It is not going to be a simple cakewalk. We are going to have to fight and fight and fight again against the bureaucrats, against those men in unsmoke-filled rooms. <laughs> against the determination of other countries to do us down. This qualified majority voting system, which has accumulated through the treaties to drive us further and further away from our democratic birthright. And furthermore, the European Court of Justice, which adjudicates over our Supreme Court and over our Parliament, your Parliament. So I, sim I simply say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that this is a historic moment. This is the moment when we fight back. So, my last words to you are simply this. We were promised two things in a speech, in a statement, made by the Prime Minister on the 23rd of March. He says, now we have the opportunity both to reform and to achieve a fundamental change in our relationship with the European Union. The first is about remaining in. And if the reforms are weak and they are unacceptable because they don't achieve the second objective. And where is that second objective? The change in the fundamental relationship of ourselves with the European Union, which can only be achieved if we leave the European Union. <laughs> Otherwise, there is no fundamental change. So I promise and pledge to you, with Peter and all the others, that we will fight and fight and fight again for your future, your interests, and our great country. Thank you so much indeed, Bill. Um, you've carried the flag for such a long time, and we're so close to winning now. My next guest has a CV so long that uh, I'd be at least another hour introducing her. But let me summarise. She was a civil servant. She worked in the Treasury. She was also ITN's chief economics editor. She was head of policy at the Institute of Directors and it goes on and on. It's much easier to say it's a great pleasure and honour to welcome the senior economic commentator in this country, Ruth Lee, CBE. Gosh, it's a bit of an obstacle course. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to be here to be talking about the economic issues, and indeed a couple of the speakers have already touched on them, so forgive me if I repeat one or two of the points they've made, but I think they're most important points. The first thing I would like to say before I go on to the economics is that I want to leave the EU because I want to live in a country that can make its own decisions and make its own way in the world without being restricted by EU membership. <laughs> I want to live in a free country, the country that actually I was born into some years ago. I, I think the picture was quite an old picture, but never mind. <laughs> it's as simple as that. But we know in the referendum campaign that economic issues are going to be very, very important. And specifically, I think, when you're talking about the Brexit's impact on trade and jobs. But clearly, the saving on the EU budget contributions will be a nice little fillip if and when we do leave, because in 2014 our net contributions, that was net of the rebate, they were £14 billion, 
which I know may or may not sound quite a big sum of money, but it's actually quite useful to have in one's pocket. Fourteen billion pounds. As for, re- uh, for trade and jobs, uh, for reasons I shall explain in a minute, I believe that in the short term, the overall impact will be absolutely minimal. People will hardly notice if we leave Brexit. Trade will continue, as one of the earlier speakers said, and so will those jobs dependent on that trade. There will be no... There'll be no Armageddon, there'll be no collapse, there'll be nothing to laugh at at all. Um, I think that was uh, Little Albert and the Lion, wasn't it, when they went to Blackpool and uh, there was no laughing, there was no drownings, there was nothing to laugh at at all, you know, to me. (laughs) But um, I I do actually come from the north of England, that's why I sort of break into this brogue every so often. (laughs) But, um, you know... I think that the people who are now saying there would be collapse or there would be Armageddon, they would be bitterly disappointed. <laughs> but I think that's in the short run. I don't think there'll be very much impact. But in the long term, as I'm, I shall say in a few minutes, I think the overall position would be absolutely beneficial to the economy of this country. But let's just go back to this trade business in the short run. Why am I so confident that the impact on trade would be absolutely minimal if Brexit? Well, last week's trade figures, last week's, please note, I've gone back to my Cheshire accent. Um, But last week's trade figures, uh, we actually had a goods deficit of 125 billion, which was yet another record. I'm sure the government's very proud about that. But I say it was a goods deficit of 125 billion. 89 billion of that deficit was with the EU. 89 billion. And 31.6 billion was with Germany alone. 31.6. That's nearly one and a half, two percent of British GDP. And I can't imagine for one second that any German car exporter or any French wine exporter to this country would want any disruption or any impediments to their trade with this country. And as a default position, as David has already said, then we would be trading under the World Trade Organization rules. We would not be bobbing around in the middle of the Atlantic. Have you heard that one recently? For some reason, these, the, these, these people who are insistent that we stay in think we'd be carted out of the mid-Atlantic beyond Rockall and bob around. <laughs> I mean, how do you have an island bob? <laughs> I just don't understand them. No, we'd be still firmly part of the world economy. There'd be no doubt about that. And let's remind ourselves that the vast majority of the p- countries of the world are not in the EU. And yet they trade. <laughs> of course, if we were just under the WTO rules, we would be subject to what is known as the Common External Tariff which excites some of us, but I suspect not many of us, but there we go. On the whole, the average tariff is now only about 1%, but there are tariffs on cars, for example, that are nearly 10. So our exporters would face that if there was no trade agreement, and indeed, the German exporters would face the tariffs that this country would impose. Obviously, they're going to get round a table and they're going to negotiate a trade agreement. It's in our interests. It's in their interests. I had the great pleasure yesterday of hearing Lord Kinnock on the Today programme. <laughs> hey! And you know what he said? He said, we, we need them more than they need us. <laughs> because our share of trade to the EU was bigger than the EU's share of trade to us. Well, I think one lady's already uh, suggested this, but in the words of another lady, no, 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 Mr. Kinnock! In 2015, on the goods account, 
they needed us more than we needed them to the tune of 89 billion pounds. <coughs> Mr. Kinnock. <laughs> uh, but commercial interests aside, and actually I think that is, as the lady earlier implied, that is what makes the world goes round. Well, that's what make, makes the world go round. Uh, the, the Lisbon Treaty has got a couple of articles that are well worth noting, well worth looking up. One is Article 8, that becomes between 7 and 9, and it says <laughs> a special, uh, that talks about a special relationship with neighbouring countries, aiming to establish an area of prosperity and good neighbourliness. Think about that, neighbourliness. They want to be friendly, that's what Article 8 says. And Article 50, of course, is about withdrawal, does say that the EU shall negotiate and conclude an agreement taking account of the framework for the future relationship with the Union. In other words, the Lisbon Treaty talks about the mood music, friendship, as well as the mechanisms for withdrawal. We should remember that. And I suspect, because I don't have that negative a view of, of our EU partners, I just don't want to be in the EU, we should remember that. And I think they would honour it. And just quickly on the three million jobs. This is something that Nick Clegg is very fond of. <laughs> uh, on the grounds that uh, it's pr presumably more vote for vote than the votes that, that Lib Dems got at the last election. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, it's a magic figure that is conjured up, taking the proportion of EU share of exports over GDP multiplied by the, the labour force, so they come up with three billion. Three million. By the way, on that basis, the number of EU jobs dependent on trade with the UK would be nearly four, but such little things never get in the way of Nick Clegg's <coughs> universe. <laughs> um, but would these be under threat? Well, if I'm right, and I think we are right, I really am quite convinced I'm right, then, and that trade is barely affected, these jobs are not under threat at all. And I think, uh, rather than go on to sort of, I'll just very, very quickly say what I would see that if we were outside Brexit, where we could get competitive advantage. We could actually amend and repeal the most irksome business regulations that, the, again, the lady said earlier, was talking about earlier. We could negotiate our own trade deals with certain countries that are important to us, like China and Japan and Australia, New Zealand, United States of America. We, the EU does not have trade agreements with those countries. And it was interested me and rather entertained me this week, because I think Sir Mike Brake said, oh, we're not big enough to negotiate our own trade, negotiate our own trade deals. Well, I'd like to remind Sir Mike that actually there's a funny little country called Iceland that managed to negotiate a trade agreement with China. <laughs> and so if Iceland's big enough, <sighs> you know, I, shucks, I think we're big enough. <laughs> The third thing I would say is that we'd be able to have a non-discriminatory immigration policy, not discriminating between the EU and non-EU nationals as we do at the moment. I think that would be a big bonus economically, and of course, as I've already implied, then we would have the benefit of the net contributions to the budget back into our own coffers. So, but to wrap up, I think in the campaign, we will have a big job of neutralising the scare stories. And the scare stories are around us all the time. You know that, they, that the, the, the Romanians, as some people call them, are going to talk about the collapse of trade. They won't trade with us. They're going to say these things. They're going to talk about the horrors of Brexit. And the CBI, of course, will be at the forefront of this misinformation. And they'll be doing their best to sort of uh, spread terror throughout the land. But they do, of course, have form. I remember debating with the CBI over the Euro campaign. They thought it was a jolly good idea to join. <laughs> and uh, life would have been doom and gloom if we hadn't done. Do you remember that? I certainly remember it. And I remember feeling very isolated at the time because we were one of the few business voices at the time that said the Euro was economically a disastrous mistake. And for those of more mature years, I've no doubt you'll remember Terence Beckett's bare-knuckle fight with Mrs Thatcher's government. It did not end well. <laughs> However, that's enough. But I really do say to all of you, I think all our hearts are in the same places here, I suspect. We would like to leave the EU. But we will have a big, big, big job 
in reassuring people that their jobs and trade will be safe if Brexit. That's where we'll have to really do some homework. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, um, a key point is that the issue of the EU is not about disliking foreigners or Europe. It's actually about democracy, and it's it's neither left-wing nor right-wing. Now, uh, John Boyd is Secretary of the Campaign Against Eurofederalism, and he's in the long, noble tradition from the Labour side, people like Tony Benn, who I had the pleasure to speak to shortly before he died, Um, a great man who really believed in parliamentary democracy. Um, And he said, uh, John Boyd has said, that the Prime Minister's reforms are not worth a light, as he puts it, uh, and that his campaign opposes the Lisbon Treaty, the foreign and security policy of the EU, uh, and uh, the costly PFI finance schemes as well. That's part of the agenda. So it's very interesting to hear this side, as I say, more from the left uh, of the spectrum. So may I introduce to you John Boyd. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction and the applause. It's not the biggest meeting I've ever addressed, but it's getting on that way. Um, I had a birthday card the other day which said, You've, everything's going for you. Your hair's going, you read inside, <laughs> your teeth are going, your eyesight's going. So I defy that by being here uh, in my later life. Um, our campaign, we call it CAFE, was founded in 1992 to address the Labour and Trade Union movement and win it back to the anti-EU position it held from the 1960s until 1988. This is the year when Jack Delors and the myth of social Europe to the trade union movement sold it to the trade union movements in Denmark, Ireland and Britain. And Henrik, a friend of mine, would tell you that. And that was in exchange for support for the European Union. This was in the run-up to the Maastricht Treaty, the single market and the single currency. And thank goodness we didn't join the single currency. (laughs) The Labour movement has organisations which represent in one way or another the aspirations of the vast majority of the population which is working class. There are nearly six and a half million trade unionists. There are still organisations, trade unions and political parties in the movement who oppose the EU. And some, there was a big trade union apparently is going to announce on Monday that it's going to join GO. I can't tell you who it is. In general, the media ignores us. I hope they don't tonight. But one thing is certain, we're not going to win this referendum without the Labour and Trade Union movement. (laughs) CAFE's position has always stood firmly on the right of nation states to self-determination national independence and democracy. And we've also stood on platforms all the way through with anybody who is opposed to the EU, and that's why we're here this evening. (laughs) The EU is the antithesis of democracy, and previous speakers have made this clear. It is a super-state governed by EU institutions, But we need to make clear there is a continent of Europe and the European Union. Don't talk about Europe. That's a propaganda victory. We must talk about the continent of Europe or the European Union. Our, (laughs) 
the searching question is, is, Europe in, is Norway in Europe? Because it's, you know the answer. The Commission is unelected, unaccountable and the executive and legislature of the EU. The Council of Ministers and EU summits use qualified majority voting, in which Britain has just 12.6% of the votes, so much for all the power and influence we have in the EU. It has to gain 15 other member states to support any proposal. That's why Mr Cameron has been going on jollies all around Europe trying to garner support for his so-called reforms. The European Court of Justice, from our point of view on the trade union side, has passed judgments which have come out against collective bargaining. There is no guarantee in the fundamental rights in the Lisbon Treaty to strike. If you can't strike, you're a slave. And they come out for the free movement of labour, which we oppose. <coughs> Did you know that in Lille, in France, there is a European rail agency where legislation for rail privatisation and other rail packages are prepared and passed to the Commission and national governments to put in place? Directives, and directives have to be put in place, <coughs> 91 stroke 440, was used to privatise the railways. There was a directive to privatise the postal services. That was never published. EU laws and legislation were changed from an intergovernmental system to a superstate and a UN union by the Lisbon Treaty, which Ruth has just mentioned. That's the old European constitution, which they cut and pasted and turned it into the Lisbon Treaty. In Britain, we did not have the opportunity to discuss and decide whether we wanted the treaty before it was ratified. If we want to leave the EU, it is the Lisbon Treaty which must be discussed. And Ruth's drawn attention to a couple of articles, and there are a lot more. Uh, and to discuss this treaty and not the charade of the trivial reforms played out today and probably tomorrow. <laughs> While that's all going on, the European Commissioner for Trade is, ne is negotiating undemocratically the secret transatlantic trade and investment treaty and it's nothing about trade at all with her counterpart in Washington. TTIP and the Associated Interstate Disputes Settlement ISDS tribunals overarch the EU with the object of bolting together the EU and the US markets with poorer regulations on food Labour, labour conditions and wages, and so on. ISDS gives transnational corporations powers to take governments to courts, their own courts, their secret courts, and there's plenty of information of that around. For instance, the Egyptian government was taken to one of these courts, fined for daring to raise the minimum wage. The clause are out via TTIP and ISDS to grab and privatise the NHS for the largest lobby group in the US, the health and pharmaceutical companies. TTIP and ISDS override our parliaments and our democracy. There is, however, a growing movement against TTIP and ISDS. For instance, a quarter of a million Germans demonstrated on the streets of Berlin against TTIP. A petition signed by over three million people was lodged with the European Parliament. <laughs> the
the TUC and most trade unions are opposed to TTIP. However, despite all this opposition, these same institutions support the EU. It's a complete contradiction. You can't be both against TTIP and for the EU. <laughs> Leave EU has published a pamphlet called Stop TTIP, and I hope you will get hold of some of these, read about it, understand it, and pass the word around. Cave says that democracy only works within nation states and not between them. There's no democracy between us and Greece, for instance. To date, the world is run with nation states having the right to self-determination and national democracy. There are more nation states today than there were ten years ago. The nation state is here to say for the foreseeable future. It is not a, it is not a 19th century anachronism. Those, those who want to end nation states and national democracy are those forces behind TTIP, ISDS and the EU. Britain as a nation state to function to the benefit of the peoples of Britain must have control of its own borders, must be able to control its fisheries and the sea underneath protect its industries and jobs involved, control borders to decide who comes into Britain. <laughs> that means bringing to an end the free movement of labour in order to protect wages and stop the race to the bottom. <laughs> and that's a trade union term. These are, all, these are the concerns of all who work for their living and their trade union. The free movement of labour and immigration are different issues. Both require control of Britain's borders. Since the 1975 referendum which I took part in, the deindustrialisation of Britain is all but complete. And I'm talking as an engineer. We had a coal industry, a steel industry, shipbuilding and a manufacturing. We traded across the world, as Ruth earlier has stated. Those industries were the backbone of the economy and which created wealth to pay for all the public services such as the NHS and the welfare state. There are 1,680,000 people out of work at the moment. Many of these are young people and their lives are being wrecked. We have soup kitchens and food banks. The alternative to EU membership is to have an economy based on manufacturing, associated industries and to trade across the world, including nation states in the EU. Instead, instead of an economy based on financial and service industries which got us into deep water. That's in addition to being locked into a crumbling and crisis-ridden EU. We need to get out of the thing. Regarding jobs, for example, part of the alternative outside the EU lies in the continent of Africa the subcontinent of India and Pakistan, which need electrification. They haven't got electrification. We should make the equipment and other manufacturers. We need a merchant navy to carry these goods and a steel industry and shipbuilding making ships to carry the goods. We can work out amongst ourselves and with others a rational future for Britain and its peoples. CAFE says the only way to oppose TTIP, ISDS, 
ruled by Brussels, and the free movement of everything is to dump the Lisbon Treaty. This This referendum is not a game of football with red and yellow cards. We must show the red card to Messrs Junker, Tusk, Schultz and Cameron. Get them off the pitch. Out. To do that, we need a massive vote to leave the EU. Yeah. On behalf of all those in the Labour movement who oppose the EU, I wish all sections of the campaign from Welletta constituency come all the best in getting us out of the EU. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you for what you've been doing all the years to promote on the left the need to come out of the EU. By the time we finish this evening, we will have speakers from all political parties and from the left right through all the way to the right and everything in between. Now, our next speaker is... Uh, uh, the chief executive of Stuff the Wind Farms. No, sorry, no, got that one wrong. It's actually Together Against Wind. Um, he, um, he overturned a 7,500 Labour majority into a 2,500 Conservative majority at the last general election. He did it, by the way, the same way as Go is going to win this referendum, by knocking on door after door and explaining that he wanted to come out of the EU and we had to control the free movement of people from the European Union. It's my great pleasure to introduce the youngest Conservative Member of Parliament, Tom Perstab MP. I've been recently campaigning a lot in East North Hampshire with the excellent Conservative candidate of Paul Wheaton. Tom Perstow. The number one issue on the doorstep is EU migration. We must win this referendum, door by door, vote by vote. And together, we will do just that. What local people tell me very, very clearly is that they voted for a common market and not the political superstate that we see today. We will win this referendum and we will take our great country out of the European Union. Well, thank you, Peter, for that um, very kind introduction. And I have to say, it is rather apt, isn't it, that a politician heads up an organisation called Together Against Win, but that is my great privilege. <laughs> and uh, a job that I enjoyed immensely prior to my election to the House of Commons. Thank you to all of you also for coming along tonight, for braving the cold, the wet, and the miserable. Um, we've been out there for much of today giving interviews on College Green. We've got very wet and cold in the process and I know that a lot of you have braved that to be here with us tonight. When I was campaigning to win in Corby and East Northamptonshire, there were two themes that came up time and time again on the doorstep. The first of those is why do politicians spend all their time bickering? Why don't they put the national interest first? Why don't they get together? Why don't they work out a way forward on the issues rather than spending their whole time arguing? And the second thing, and I think this is going right to the heart of why we're all here tonight, is that desire for an EU referendum, a vote on whether we stay in or whether we come out. And what people used to say to me, and they still say to me when I go out and knock on doors at weekends, is that they voted for a free trade in a common market in the 1970s not a political superstate. Now the good news is I think we're achieving on the first of those. 
Look at the panel that we've already got. And by the end of the night, I think you're going to be really impressed about the breadth of political figures that we have represented. We're all putting aside our political differences, the petty squabbles that have gone on in the past, the disagreements that people have had, they don't matter. What matters is getting our great country out of the European Union. And on the second of those points, let's look at the renegotiation scorecard in some detail. Oh, and by the way, if someone could just do me a huge favour, if there's white smoke coming out of the chimney while I'm speaking, please shout so that I can tailor my remarks accordingly. But we do know, for sure, at this point in time, that the renegotiation will not stop us sending £350 million a week to Brussels. Money that we could spend on our own public services, the police, the fire service, our hospitals, our schools. They need extra funding, and we could deliver that if we came out of the European Union. We could also make our own laws, laws that work in our national interest and not in the interests of other European countries. I'm proud to be a Member of Parliament. It is an enormous honour and a privilege to represent Corby and East Northamptonshire in the House of Commons. And I think that it should be my job, and along with my colleagues from across the House, to make the laws, not have them imposed upon us by the unelected, unaccountable European Commission. And you know what? I also want us to be able to control our own borders properly. But not only that, I want Britain to have a fair immigration system, one that doesn't discriminate people, one that works the same regardless of where you come from in the world. How can it be right that if you come from Australia or you come from America or you come from anywhere in the Commonwealth, it is more difficult for you to get into this country than if you came from within the EU? And I tell you what brought that home to me, and it was in my role as a constituency MP. Before Christmas, I visited a small company in Colby. It employs six or seven people, really doing well, only just started up in the last 12 months, keen to export to markets outside of the European Union. And they'd taken on a young man who was from New Zealand, and he was doing really well. The company had invested in him, he was enjoying the job, he wanted to stay. They also wanted to export to that New Zealand and Australian market, which he'd have been in a prime position to help them do. But he had to go back. And as the local MP, I fought blooming hard to try and make sure that he could stay, because he was contributing. He was doing the right thing. He was going to help this small firm grow. How can it be right that people like that are being turned away when we have uncontrolled immigration from elsewhere? That, to me, just isn't right. And I also want Britain to be able to trade globally. There's a whole world out there. Why should we be restricted to the European protection racket that we are at the moment? Come on, let's face it. The Germans are not going to stop selling Mercedes or BMWs or Audis to Britain if we pull out of the EU. There's a whole world out there. Let's get out there. Let's trade with it. Let's sign our own trade agreements. Let's work with developing countries. That's much better than sticking plaster aid. That is the way forward, and we could do that outside of the European Union. And as the MP for Corby, I can also tell you that the analysis you heard earlier on in relation to the steel industry is absolutely right. I'm very proud to represent a steel town. We have 600 people employed in Corby still in our steelworks. Those people work incredibly hard, day in, day out, produce fantastic products that are sold around the world. And the European Commission are making it much harder. We are not getting to grips with Chinese dumping, and state aid rules are stopping us getting the help that our steel industry needs to them in a speedy and timely manner. The work that ministers in this country have been trying to do around helping with energy costs was held up for months and months and months by the European Commission. Unacceptable. So by any measure, on all the tests that my constituents set for the renegotiation, I think the vast majority 
of them would conclude that whatever the final deal is, it simply will not be enough and that the renegotiation will have failed. And you know what? It's also the case that it won't be worth the paper it's written on. I mean, would any of you in this room trust the European Union to deliver on promises? And the grassroots campaigning is going to be so important because the whole EU machinery, the minute that that piece of white paper is waved in the air, will be ploughing in to try and tell the great British people why it is that we are better off in the EU. And we need to take the case door by door, vote by vote, and win this referendum for our great country. And Helen Harrison, who set out earlier on the work that we're going to do on the ground with a task force structure. Helen was a key part of my team in winning in Corby and East North Hampshire, and she got it so right in the description that she set out. We have to work together. We have to work cross-party. We have to work across the different leave groups. Petty wrangles, all of those things that have gone in, in the past do not matter. Let's come together at these task force meetings, work together, get out there and win it door by door, vote by vote. So let the message go out loud and clear from this hall here in the heart of Westminster tonight, from all those who wish to leave, that we must work together. And together we will get our great country out of the European Union. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have a question for you. Would you rather have conviction politicians like Tom running the country, or you want unelected European bureaucrats? I think I know the answer. Thank you so much indeed, Tom. Now, the next Member of Parliament I'm going to introduce to you um, has actually been in Parliament for 27 years. In fact, come to think of it, she was elected before you were born, Tom. <laughs> in the House of Commons, when her name goes up on the annunciator, people rush into cha to the chamber to hear what she has to say. She has been independent-minded, she says what she thinks, she's consistently opposed the European Union. She's one of the three co-founders of GO. She's a member of Labour GO. It is my great pleasure and real honour to introduce Kate Hoey, Member of Parliament for Vauxhall. The idea that it's the European Union that has brought us all these social benefits and trade union rights when we have seen recently what is happening in terms of Greece and the way that workers have been totally unprotected there. I do wish the people who want to stay yeah. would stop talking about Europe. Europe is a much bigger area. I love Europe. We're not anti-Europe. We're anti the European Union. We have huge support out there amongst Labour Party members at the grassroots and Labour supporters. This referendum will not be one to leave the EU by MPs. It's going to be the public who decide and the last thing they want at the moment, at the moment is these stitch-ups between politicians cosy at Westminster. Out in the country, the mood is very, very different. Well, what a wonderful, wonderful audience. And it is such a privilege to be here as a Labour MP supporting the grassroots out movement. I was so delighted uh, to be working with Peter and Tom when we first thought about this in a little room in one of the uh, House of Commons' outbuildings. And uh, we would really wanted to do this because we genuinely felt that there wasn't that unity at the grassroots, that the campaigning wasn't being done, that needed to be done, that there was too cosy a group of people organising in some of the campaigns, and that we had to take that control back to where the 
the, the, the job is going to have to be done, and that, it's the gra is that, that is at the grassroots. So that's why I am a total supporter of the grassroots movement, and it's because of that significant cross-party support that we've now got. I don't know what the Electoral Commission will do, but certainly if I was advising the Electoral Commission, I would say designate the grassroots out movement. You know, many of us in grassroots out will disagree. Many of us in this platform tonight will disagree about many, many issues. Some people might not even like some people. I don't know whether I'm in that category or not. But there are no doubt about it. When you're working in cross-party groups, you're working with organisations that you may not have every bit of what they say you agree with. And it is very, very important. But, you know, what unites us all doesn't matter whether we, we have personality differences, whether we have political differences, as I said, whether we don't like those people. What unites us is that we want to get our country back and we want to get out of the EU. And that is the number one issue. And that's why, that's why over the next few weeks and months, there will be big grassroots movements meeting across the United Kingdom because in order to win, we have to reach out far, far away from this area of Westminster. We have to get out into the country. Now, you know, one of the things that uh, any movement has, most movements throughout the world have a symbol. They have something that becomes associated with their movement. And tonight, I want to just suggest that maybe our grassroots movement could have a symbol. And I think a very, very good symbol of our grassroots movement would be this. A piece of white paper saying nothing, showing that, frankly, our Prime Minister has more or less capitulated to the European Union. It may be, it may be, it may be that... Uh, it may be that this will take off and that whenever David Cameron appears anywhere in the country, people will hold up, dignified, very nicely, a piece of white paper. Now, as, um, as Peter so terribly reminded you, I was, uh, I was a, an MP when Tom was born, but I think that shows just the breadth of the age range as well that we've got within our movement. And you know, during those 27 years, I've taken every opportunity I could to vote against attempts by the EU to further integrate and remove our sovereignty. And a number of my colleagues, including the, my leader of my party and the shadow chancellor, Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell, believed, like me, that our membership of the EU was incompatible with Labour values. We followed, we followed in the uh, footsteps of the great Labour figures like Hugh Gateskill, Barbara Castle, Peter Shaw and of course Tony Benn. And that's why it is so incredibly disappointing that somehow, somewhere within the Labour machinery, Jeremy and John have been stifled. Now maybe, maybe we will see that in the next week or two, next month or two, they may break out. Because I would give a message to my leader and to the leader of the Labour leadership tonight, is that around the country, you know, I'm often told, well, you're in a minority. There's only a few of brave members of parliament speaking out. And there are, there are probably not, not that many of us. But they're growing every day. The silent ones are beginning to come out. And I, I would say to Jeremy and to our party's leadership, that around the country there are millions of Labour voters and Labour supporters or ex-Labour supporters who have been left without a voice on the most important issue in our lifetime. And <laughs> Jeremy, Jeremy, talked, Jeremy talked about re-engaging with our, our voters and his, his, his election undoubtedly brought excitement back into politics but on the most significant issue of our lifetime, the Labour Party 
has been sadly left behind, not just within the Labour movement, I believe, but certainly with the mood of the country. And I think that is a terrible, terrible shame, and the Labour Party will live to regret it. Our Labour voters, our Labour, our Labour voters out there expect expect the leadership of our party to challenge the terms of the membership of a club which has no democratic accountability, threatens our National Health Service with the dangerous uh, transatlantic trade partnership, drives down exploitative wages with cheap, unskilled labour from Eastern Europe because of free movement, and has promoted zero-hour contracts. And I just cannot understand how anyone who is opposed to TTIP cannot see the logic of not being also opposed to the, Euro the, over, uh, to the European Union. And I also believe that the decision by our Secretary of the Labour Party, G Secretary General Ian McNichol, where he was actually formally, in writing, discouraging Labour branches to have this debate, was a mistake. What does it say? They're obviously afraid of Labour Party members having a debate. Now, that does tell you something about a political institution and a political party, and I do not believe that that represents the views of some of the members of our shadow cab cabinet. You know, I often think that the people who are most proud of our country are those that want to leave the European Union. They believe, as we've heard earlier, that we're good enough to trade with the world and decide our own destiny. It is those that want to remain, that do not believe in the United Kingdom and do not believe yeah, yeah. we are good enough to stand on our own two feet. And I, and I, believe, and I believe, as a Labour MP, that voting to leave is the progressive and safe option in this referendum. It's a vote to leave a club whose influence in the world is declining each day. And as Ruth Lee has so well put, we, it is no longer that great economic area. We need to get out of it and we need to look outwards. We look, need to look internationally and we look, need to look to our Commonwealth links who we so disgracefully, disgracefully <laughs> let down. ourselves, the whole might, as has already been said by many people, the whole might of the British establishment will be turned on to us. The political parties at levels in the leadership, the bankers who are trying to bankroll the stay-in campaign, the CBI, they will all be trying to influence the debate and they will be producing scare story after scare story. But we can and we will defeat them because the referendum is not about them. It's not about us here on the platform. It's about all of us and those watching at home because you yourself can do so much to make this referendum a success. Just think what an emancipation a Nexit would bring. It would allow the UK to sell freely to the whole of the world, including all of Europe, and it would also allow for the less developed countries to sell freely to us. The net effect of this would be to improve their standard of living, helping to remove the desire for their people to move to the UK and depleting their own human resources, which would be a win for everyone. policy as it stands now condemns impoverished countries to a form of hopeless servitude that should have been marginalised and got rid of and consigned to history. How can anyone in the left condone that? It is time, it is time for democratic governments across the EU, and I don't think we'll be alone if we leave. I think there are many other EU countries and movements within those countries who realise this is a failed project. They want to begin again to represent the real interests of the people 
and we can lead that way. I love my country. I'm very proud of being British. I'm very proud. I believe in the United Kingdom, and I have confidence in our ability to once again be a self-governing nation. But you individually here can do so much. Every morning, each one of you should wake up and think, who can I persuade today? Who can I speak to? Who can I go and campaign in? Who can I talk to in the supermarket? persona non grata in my supermarket because I always chat to people and say what do you think about the EU and you know it is amazing we heard from the taxi driver earlier it is amazing when people are asked what they think and we know that we've got out there in the country millions and millions of people many of whom have never voted before. That's why we're going to win this referendum, because they are going to show that they care enough to actually come out and vote to get their country back. So the referendum gives us a chance. We mustn't let it pass. Let's make it happen, and let us rejoin the rest of the world. Well, thank you, Kate, for a, a very inspiring and wonderful speech. Um, we really felt your passion and belief in the Union and your country. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as a Conservative MEP, I'm particularly delighted to have David Davis uh, heading up Conservative Go within the wider Go movement. Now, David is obviously a leading Eurosceptic. You know him well. Uh, but he's also a former Foreign Office Minister responsible for negotiations with Europe and NATO, so he knows what he's talking about. Um, he was a Shadow Home Secretary and recently launched a series of fascinating and well-informed and positive speeches about life outside the European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Davis. How unusual for an elected politician He's a rather nice chap who's even quite popular. Please welcome David Davis. Democracy without being able to get rid of bad government. And how do you get rid of the European Commission? And well, actually, we're going to have a chance on the 23rd of June. The nation state is a moral concept. You won't get a German saying that, I promise you. A nation state is a moral concept. Why? Because it's the highest manifestation of real democracy. And that's why we should hang on to our nation state, treasure it, love it, keep it, and get it back. I've never done a speech with trailers before. <laughs> You know, uh, the, the chairman said, told you that I used to be the Shadow uh, Home Secretary. And in that job, I used to have to go and speak to a lot of unusual audiences. Uh, one of the more difficult ones was going to speak to prisoners in prisons. It used to give me a, a problem about how I could start. You know, standing in Wandsworth Prison, it's a privilege to be here, didn't really work. <laughs> And, uh, and looking at a bunch of rapists and murderers and frauds and so on, you know, it's, a, it's an honour to speak to you didn't work either. You know? so, so I came up with a formula which, looking at you lot, would work here, here actually. Um, uh, and it, it was, uh, I'm so pleased to see so many of you here. <laughs> the, the... Now, I, I, I say that because uh, earlier this evening, um, I was one of several hundred people who were locked out by the health and safety police from this meeting <laughs> because there are too many of you to fit in. You're above the fire standards. So I said, said something about the organisation, so well done all of you for, for getting here. <laughs> particularly, particularly because the time has come. The time has come 
for our nation to make the greatest decision of our generation, for our nation to stand on its own two feet, and for our nation to take control of its own destiny. And before we talk about that, I'd like to start by getting rid of the inferiority complex that our political opponents in this argument seem to suffer from. They don't believe in our country. I'd like you all to remember, everybody in this room, just remember how lucky you are. How lucky you are to be born in this country. Because we are an incredibly fortunate country. You know, we, how, you know, how would you expect a country of 60 million people, a tiny island off the cold northwest shore of Europe, to be as important, as powerful, as influential, as wealthy, to have as much reach as Britain does. Now, we are uh, on the, on the, a permanent member of the UN Security Council. We're a leading member of the G7. We're a leading member of the Commonwealth. We're a leading NATO member and America's favorite ally. And we, of course, we're widely respected worldwide. All of that before we joined the European <laughs> Union. <laughs> And why? Well, because we're the country of William Shakespeare and Isaac Newton, of Faraday and Rutherford, of Charles Darwin and Alexander Fleming. We're the country that created, that started the Industrial Revolution. Our language, the English language, is the dominant international language in science, engineering, medicine, the internet, TV and film, if you count American, <laughs> international commerce, even international law. You know, it's amazing. All those Russian oligarchs come and sort out their arguments in the royal courts of justice. <laughs> so, we have all that. But above all of this, we created the first liberal democracy in the modern world. We are the first Democrats. And again, we did this before we joined the EU. So we are different. And this is something I noticed when I was a Europe Minister. We are different. Remember the origins of, every, not everybody else's, but most of the other countries' involvement in the European Union. Germany and France and Italy created the precursor after years of dictatorship and defeat. When Spain joined, it was after the, the, the dictator Franco. Portugal, after the dictator Catano. Greece, after the colonels. Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, the entire Eastern European group, after escaping from under the Soviet jackboot. So it's hardly surprising for them that the European Union represents modernity and democracy. That's what they're comparing it with. But we had democracy for a century and a half before we joined. So we know what it really means. And we know that it isn't just about casting a vote. It's about casting out bad governments. And as you heard me say on there, how do you cast out the European Commission? So we have a problem with the way democracy works in Europe. And this is not an esoteric issue to be discussed in democracy or politics 101 on a PPE course. This has real serious implications. We've had a very good set of recent demonstrations. Look what they did to Greece. For the European elite conspired with a crooked Greek government and Goldman Sachs, those well-known bankers, <laughs> to bring Greece into the euro wrongfully on fraudulent numbers. <laughs> and who did they punish? Did they punish the, the uh, crooked Greek government? No, they didn't. 
Did they punish Goldman Sachs? I don't think so. You saw the advert, didn't you? The simple truth is, they punished the Greek people. They imposed policies on the country that crippled it. Cut its economy by a quarter. Not a recession, not a, not a slowdown, not a stop. They cut the size of the economy by a quarter. Unemployment soared, youth unemployment 60%. They took away the chances of an entire generation. But that wasn't all. Hospitals were closed. Food consumption went down by 25%. <coughs> Children died. Infant mortality went up by 40%. TB rates doubled, HIV up, malaria back. That's what this so-called democratic European Union did to Greece. I'd just like you to imagine for a second if any British government tried to do something like that to a part of our country, what would happen? Can you imagine if we visited policies like that on Lancashire or Lincolnshire? I speak as a Yorkshireman. Uh, or Lincolnshire. You know. <laughs> the government would be challenged in Parliament, and if it didn't put it right, it would fall. But not in Europe. That is the price of not being a real democracy. And what are we being offered today to fix this imperious bureaucracy? A deal that will not give power back to Parliament. A deal that will not give us control over our own borders. A deal that will not protect the City of London. And a deal which will not change the treaty in any way. And as a result, will not limit the European Court from overruling governments and parliaments alike in any country they choose to. And to add to insult to injury today, we have Belgium's proposal that we never be allowed to object to anything ever again. <laughs> you know, my memory may be faulty, but I think I'm right in saying that Napoleon described Belgium as a country invented by the English to embarrass the French. <laughs> Well, maybe they're trying to get their own back. You know? <laughs> I suppose we should be used to being threatened. We're a big, powerful country. We should be used to being threatened. We are threatened by Napoleon, threatened by the Kaiser, threatened by Hitler, threatened by Brezhnev. Ah, you know, threatened by the French and the Germans and the Russians, fine. But by the Belgians? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that's how, this, that's how this campaign is going. I don't know what you call the other side of the argument, the in-crowd or the Romanians or whatever they're called, but the in-crowd are trying to threaten us too. We're told if we leave we won't be allowed to trade with the European Union. Really? Really? Under, inter under international agreements signed by the EU, tariffs are limited to 5%, except for a couple of categories. Agriculture and cars. Who makes wine and cars? <laughs> now, if you want to see why we're guaranteed to get a deal, I want you to answer in your mind two questions. First, who is the most powerful politician in Europe? Frau Merkel. Angela Merkel. A prize for the man in the front there. <laughs> Secondly, I don't want you to do this, but metaphorically, I'd like you to all to go outside in a road and count up the number of Audis, BMWs, Mercedes, Volkswagens, they're the one with the smoke trail behind them. <laughs> Count them up. There are over a quarter, nearly a third, actually, it's nearly 30% now, of British car, oh, cars sold in Britain are from those four makes. And that's not counting the, uh, the Skodas and the Seats, who are also owned by, owned by uh, German companies. We're the second fastest growing, uh, sorry, we're the fastest growing car market in Europe, the second biggest, and we will be the biggest uh, in due course. What do you think will happen the day after Brexit to Angela Merkel? There'll be the chief executives of all those companies hammering on her door, demanding free access to the British market, for which the price will be free access 
to their market. So you can be sure we'll get a deal. Oh, what, are, what else is there on Project Fear? Oh, yes. They say that we could not deport criminals back to the UK without the EU. Really? What do they think happened before the EU? They really think that European countries would refuse to deport criminals, terrorists back to the UK? We've got one of the biggest, most powerful anti-terrorist criminal and criminal intelligence organisations in Europe, in our country. We are one of the most effective anti-terrorist operators in the Western world. You really think they're not going to negotiate and deal with us over the return of terrorists to the UK? It's ridiculous. It's stupid. It's uh, absolutely, after Paris in particular, it's offensive nonsense. So I say to you all, we have nothing to fear but Project Fear itself. Now, I've got to catch a train, sadly, so I'm going to have to draw this to a close. But I'll, I want you really to characterise in a British way how I see. <laughs> I'm sorry, Prime Minister. No. <laughs> <it's okay>. um, <laughs> I wanted to characterise the British way, in a British way how I really saw what was coming next, and, and I lit upon uh, an extract, or a poem, in fact, by G.K. Chesterton called "The Secret People." It's about us. It's actually about the English. So, those of you who are not English, okay, but it's about us broadly. And I'm just going to read you six lines. They're not in sequence. I'm going to read you six lines from that poem because I think they say something to us. You laugh at us and love us, both mugs and eyes are wet, and you do not know us, for we have not spoken yet. We hear men speaking for us of new laws, strong and sweet, yet is there no man speaketh as we speak in the street? Smile at us, pass us, pay us, but do not quite forget for we are the people of England that have not spoken yet. <laughs> On June the 23rd, the people of England will speak, and the people of Scotland and Northern Ireland and Wales and they will speak in a strong and clear voice and they will say give us back our heritage, give us back our future, give us back control of our own country. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, as a Conservative MEP, I'm proud to have been former Deputy Leader of UKIP as well. Uh, our next speaker, I know to have shown a great deal of bravery and resilience in the face of the EU establishment. There is no official opposition in the European Parliament, but there is Farage. <laughs> Now, as you may have noticed, um, Nigel Farage is seated within touching distance of the President of the European Commission and the European Parliament. He's in the eye line of the Council President Donald Tusk, and he's looked down upon by President Schultz, President of the European Parliament. There's an awful lot of presidents in the EU, isn't there? And behind him is often a wall of sound of anger and horror. And that's just from his supporters. 
but he does make an awful lot of sense. If every politician has nine lives like cats, then Nigel's used up most of those nine. Uh, as you know, he survived great challenges, such as that awful plane crash. William Haig has called him one of the best orators in the business, and I agree. Ladies and gentlemen, Nigel Farage. centre and on the right. Right across every member state in this union, and that is why we see the bill in the faces. Increasingly people are saying, we don't want that flag, we don't want the anthem, we don't want this political class. And the question that I want to ask, the question that I want to ask, that we're all going to ask is, who are you? I've never heard of you. Nobody in Europe has ever heard of you. I'll share a platform with virtually anybody that believes we should get back our independence and self-government in this country. And I, look, and I look forward to working with Conservative MPs, Conservative Ministers, as indeed I want to work with Labour figures or Green figures or anybody across the political spectrum. warm welcome. Um, I've come here tonight straight from Brussels, which is more than can be said of the Prime Minister who's still there. But I've heard in the last ten minutes that a deal has now finally been done. So perhaps we could put David up for an Oscar. Because he kept telling us he was battling for Britain and he was up till five o'clock in the morning. A deal has been done, but what kind of deal is it? Just think back three years to that Bloomberg speech, the high vaunting ambitions, the fundamental treaty change, the change of Britain's relationship, powers back to the United Kingdom. There was even talk of reform of the European Union itself. And what has happened over the last 48 hours is a British Prime Minister has gone to meet 20, 27 other heads of state and frankly given an impression of Oliver Twist by saying, please gentlemen, can I have some more concessions? Is that what we've sunk to as a nation? I think we're better than that, don't you? Yeah. I think we're better than that. And this deal, this deal that he's done, and we'll get the details perhaps in the next hour or so, but this deal that he's done does not address the fundamental issues that British people care about. It does not address the issue that our Parliament is not able to overrule bad EU law. It does not address the issue that we should not be paying £55 million a day to a club whose accounts have not been signed off for nearly 20 years. It, it does not, and it does not address the fundamental issue and the number one issue in British politics, which is that we have a total open door to over 500 million people. It does none of those things, and yet, and yet, after a cabinet meeting at nine o'clock tomorrow morning, there'll be a press conference, and the Prime Minister will tell you he's won this amazing deal that we've been given permission to limit migrant benefits for up to four years. Well, even that deal is no good because the European Parliament have the ability to pick it to pieces and veto it and any other promise of what will be written into a future European treaty can be struck down by the European Court of Justice. Dave's deal is not worth the paper that it's written on. And yet when Donald Tusk wrote to him on the 4th of February, he said the deal looked so good that he would now, in a referendum, vote for Britain to join the European Union. <laughs> well, let's have a little think about that, shall we? Imagine the Prime Minister saying, I'm calling a referendum on June the 23rd to ask you, the British people, to join the European Union. Yes, I know that since Simon de Montfort, 
we've had a sovereign parliament, but really this is now rather outdated, and wouldn't it be better if henceforth 75% of our laws were made elsewhere? He would say that our Supreme Court hasn't been doing a bad job, but really, wouldn't it be better to hand over the ultimate judicial power in this country to a court in Luxembourg staffed by people, none of whom are actually judges? <laughs> he might say, I know you've been familiar with the idea that a nation state controls its borders, that a nation state can decide who comes to live, work and settle in that country. But for goodness sake, we wouldn't want to be like Australia in the modern world, would we? I mean, the idea, the idea that we should stop people coming into our country who've got criminal records just shows you how Australia's changed, doesn't it, really? <laughs> So anyone can come in, we'll have a total open door to over 500 million people. Uh, the concept that the National Health Service could deal with 65 million people again, wouldn't it be better to open up the health service to 508 million people? I'm not sure that would go down very well. He'd probably say that the idea that we have control over our seas up to 200 miles of the North Sea is really terribly unfair on our European neighbours and what we're going to do is close down the British fishing industry and give it away to Europe. Oh and by the way, for the benefit of all of this, we're going to pay a membership fee <laughs> of over £50 million a day which is the equivalent of building a new district hospital every single week. Does anybody in this room or in this country think that we would vote now to join this European Union? No. Well, absolutely right. And what we're going to be asked to do is asked to remain in a union that will not be static. We'll be asked to remain in a union that has now a very ambitious foreign policy, which I believe in many ways could prove to be dangerous. We'll be asked to remain in a union that is fanatical in its attempt to centralise all power and to sweep away the ability of nation-state parliaments and the electorates to change the laws by which they live. We'll be asked to remain in a European Union that is so hell-bent on expansion that it now wants, within five years, for Turkey to become a member. We'll be asked to vote to remain in a union whose currency is clearly a failure, where tens of millions of people in the Mediterranean have been impoverished, and we'll be asked to vote to stay in a union whose migration policy, as expressed by Mr Juncker, and then by the one that seemed to be um, inevitably heading as the greatest modern German leader, but not any longer, Angela Merkel, whose disastrous decision to say, O oh, come, all ye faithful, <laughs> has, led, has, led, has led to a million people settling in Germany in one year, and now we see Schengen under collapse. We're being asked to remain in a union that has no popular consent anywhere in Europe, asked to remain in a union that when it was frank with the peoples of Europe, when it said it had a constitution, Saw the, saw the French and the Dutch reject it and yet ignored their will and pushed on with the Lisbon Treaty. We'll be asked to remain in a union that now resembles a burning building, but the good news, folks, is there is an exit door and I suggest we take it. There will, be, there will be arguments over the next few months about economics. There will be arguments about trade. There will be arguments about security. There will be arguments about defence. But there's one argument above all that we in this movement must grasp. 
And we must understand that actually what has happened in our country, perhaps ever since Suez, back in the 1950s, is that our ruling classes have collectively lost faith in our ability to make our own laws, to control our own borders, to make our own trade deals, to stand on the world stage. They make arguments. They say we're not big enough to be on our own. We're not strong enough to be on our own. But what they mean, what they mean is we're not good enough to stand on our own. And their chief spokesperson now, Emma Thompson. <laughs> Well, Peter Mandelson thinks the same thing, doesn't he? Tony Blair thinks the same thing, doesn't he? Nick Clegg thinks the same thing. And, oh, did we get more booze for Clegg than Emma Thompson? I can't believe it. But the point is, ladies and gentlemen, they don't think we're good enough. They don't believe in this country. They don't believe in the people of this country. And I do believe in the people of this country and this campaign. This campaign must be upbeat and optimistic. This campaign must be about respecting those that went before us and defended parliamentary democracy against the world at war and our determination to hand that legacy of freedom, liberty, justice and pride in who we are to our children and grandchildren. This is what we're fighting for. This is what we're fighting for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I've spent 20 years of my life battling for this great cause, waiting for this moment where we get a referendum and get a chance to get our country back. I am thrilled that at last it's actually happening. I'd felt for years that I might become the patron saint of lost causes. <laughs> uh, but I've realised right from the very beginning that what was actually going on between the groups in this country that said they wanted to compete to leave the EU was actually somewhat toxic. There was a, you know, a war, an artillery war going on between organisations and bad things being said. And that's why you know, I commend Bone, Perslav and Hoey for getting go, for getting grassroots out off the ground. It's a fantastic initiative. And I joined it, and UKIP have joined it, and the exciting thing about GO is that we are a genuine cross-party movement of people who might not always agree on domestic policy, but are absolutely united in fighting to get back our democracy, to get back our liberty, our freedom of our nation. And I, my, our last speaker tonight, I think very much proves that point. Our last speaker tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is without doubt one of the greatest orators in this country. He's a towering figure on the left of British politics and he's coming onto this platform today to join the Grassroots Out movement and I want you to give a very big warm welcome to George Galloway. Comrades and friends. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank Nigel Farage very sincerely for his kind welcome. The more generous because Nigel and I agree on hardly anything at all. <laughs> but we do agree at least on one thing. And it happens to be the most important thing, not only now, but in the lifetime of everyone in this hall and everyone in this country. It is the demand that Britain should be an independent, sovereign and democratic country and that means leaving 
the European Union. In this hall, as in this country, all of us will have different visions of what our country could be, should be. But the fundamental point is, none of us here in this hall, none of us here in this country are in a position to decide which vision of Britain should come to pass. Because that power has been given away to a lavishly funded Eurocratic state to a toothless, fantastically financed pseudo-parliament and to a council of ministers of countries which, to be fair, how could it be otherwise, act in their own national interests rather than ours. And that means that our independence as a country is no more and we have an exit door as Nigel just said, and if we don't take it, then we and our children and their children will lament and regret that we did not take that opportunity which now comes before us on the 24th of June. I, uh, I wanted to be here to nail the lie that to be on this side of the argument is to be on the political right. I fought the 1975 referendum behind my then leader, the late and great Right Honourable Tony Benn, and it's in memory of him that I'm standing here this evening. Tony Benn won us the right to have a referendum in 1975 and this I must say, but for Nigel Farage we would not be having a referendum on this question. to nail the lie that being a member of the European Union has anything to do with left. As my friend for nearly 40 years, though she was obviously a child then, Kate Hoy, <laughs> pointed out what's left about TTIP allowing American corporations to smash down the doors of the National Health Service and privatize what they like with the power of law behind them. What's left about driving down workers' wages and conditions? What's left about a situation? And you know, this I must say, I know that this is one of my differences with Nigel. I have not just respect but love for the people of Romania. I'm the only person in this room that has published a book in the Romanian language. I even speak a little bit of Romanian. But I cannot agree to subcontract to the Romanian government the right to decide who can come and live and work in Britain, who we can deport from Britain, what level of deficit we can run in Britain or what our foreign policy in Britain should be. That I cannot do. I want to nail the lie that to be on this side of the argument is to wallow in nationalism. As a matter of fact, I hate nationalism. I fought Scottish nationalism all my life and I helped win the referendum in Scotland 
in 2014 defeating Scottish nationalism. I hope to help win this referendum in a few months' time. That's why I'm pleased to say I have yesterday, on behalf of my party, signed up as an affiliate of Grassroots Out, and I hope that the Electoral Commission will give this broadly based all-party campaign the designation of the official Out campaign. But neither am I a British nationalist. Being a Scotsman from Irish background, I can hardly be called a little Englander. <laughs> there is nothing internationalist about locking yourself out of the world. There is nothing internationalist about locking yourself in, although the locks seem to have broken, into a rich man's club in a part of Europe. I want the world to be our oyster. I want to trade with the Commonwealth that we so shamefully abandoned when we joined the European Union in 1975. I want to trade with Brazil, with Russia, with India, with China, with South Africa, with Iran, where the sun is rising, not setting, and where most of the customers in the world actually live. So we will not be cutting ourselves off from anything if we leave the European Union. We will be opening ourselves to the entire world. Now that is internationalism. Now, I mentioned, I mentioned the Eurocrats. I was a member of the British Parliament for almost 30 years, and I woke up one morning to discover that somebody called Catherine Ashton was now my foreign minister. <coughs> like Nigel in the wonderful footage you just saw, my question was, who are you? <laughs> who elected you? Who can remove you? And I watched as this person I'd never heard of before, on our behalf, dragged us into one confrontation after another with one adversary after another. Now, to be fair, it may very well be that the British government, maybe any British government, certainly in recent years, would have taken us into those same confrontations. But at least I could have fought against that here and Parliament could have overturned that there. And David Davis has left, a man I greatly love and respect. <laughs> David Davis and I were part of an epic debate in 2014 when that genius Cameron tried to <laughs> persuade us to become the Air Force for ISIS and Al-Qaeda and start bombing Syria. The American Air Force was warming up on the tarmac, just waiting for a rubber stamp from the British Parliament of David Cameron's point of view. But in an epic debate in which speeches changed the outcome, his speech and my speech among them changed the outcome, we defeated Cameron and the engines had to be switched off at the Andrews Air Base and we narrowly, by 13 votes, avoided becoming embroiled in a disaster. That's the kind of parliamentary sovereignty I believe in, and that's the kind that we can have if we need this European Union. Now, finally, finally, I don't want you to think that I'm any kind of pacifist against all wars. If I was alive, and of age, I would have been among the first in the queue to volunteer to fight in the Second World War. Indeed, I would have been one of those agitating that we should confront fascism earlier and with all the vigor that we could then muster. But the war, when it came, 
was, as Mr. Churchill said, our finest hour, when we all went forward together, Mr. Churchill and Mr. Attlee and Mr. Bevan, together as one front rank leading the British people, never as united before or since, and we wrote our name in the stars. That's what we are doing here tonight. Mr. Farage and me, Ms. Hoy and Mr. Davis, left, right, left, right, forward march to victory on the 23rd of June. Ladies and gentlemen, as a right-wing Conservative Member of Parliament, it gives me great pleasure to say, what a wonderful speech, George Galloway. <laughs> Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, it shows that the Go movement is not a UKIP front. It's not a Tory front, it's not a Labour front, and it's not a respect front. It is a movement where everyone works together. And the final thing we have to do tonight is sign the GO pledge. And it says, we the undersigned declare that in the weeks and months ahead, we shall set aside party politics and work together towards our common goal of a free and prosperous United Kingdom outside the U European Union, engaged with the wider world and governed by its own laws. And we're going to sign that pledge right now. So, ladies, so if, if this huge crowd can make its way up here, we can sign the declaration. <laughs> Too much to hope. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, Helen next. No. I would like him here as well. He's next. <laughs> oh, yes. And by the way, while we're signing this, thank you so much for coming and have a safe trip home. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.